Dear Ajahn, there are many different teachings about jhanas around. Could you please explain what leads to the first and any other <coughs> relevant jhana and how to tell if it's a real thing? So, the, the factors of jhana Vitaka, Vichara, Piti, Sukha, Ekagatha. One of the kind of hallmarks of Ajahn Chah's style of teaching was that he didn't emphasize trying to get jhana and he didn't talk about it much. And neither, neither does Ajahn Anand. And uh, one of the main reasons I believe is a desire for the subtle samadhi states is an obstruction to them. So they place emphasis on laying the causes and then they will occur in their own time. I personally don't believe it's the case that you can just study a theory or a method and apply it and get jhana. I, I don't believe that's the case. I think there are a lot of people who think they have jhana who don't because it's uh, not common. First jhana apana samadhi is very, very peaceful. One of the problems with trying to define jhanas is that when people have a tendency of overestimation, Ajahn Anand has explained that neighborhood concentration, so he explains that kanika concentration is when there aren't many thoughts and your mind feels peaceful and calm and a little, a little bit peaceful for five minutes, then there'll be some thoughts again and there's that sense of, oh, that was nice, that was peaceful. That's Kanika Samadhi. Upajara Samadhi, Tanajan ex defines, explains as 10, 15, 20 minutes where there's very little thoughts and the thoughts are quite wholesome, but there's a feeling of tranquility, serenity, well-being, but the hindrances are significantly pacified. That's Upajara Samadhi. The challenge, however, is Tanajan Anand explains that Upajara Samadhi has a coarse, an intermediate, and a refined level. So I think it's the case sometimes that somebody has coarse Upajara, and they may think it's the first jhana. They have intermediate Upajara, they think it's the second jhana. They have refined Upajara, they think it's the third jhana, and they have not yet experienced jhana. So this is one of the challenges of trying to get them and trying to define them. When you look at the factors of jhana, vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, ekagata, as I've been saying all throughout the retreat, I've been giving you instructions that would lead to jhana. Were your merits, efforts, and mindfulness strong enough? If you didn't get jhana, you may not have done anything wrong. It's just, a, it's just a matter of one has to keep laying the causes. So with vitaka and vichara, the instruction to keep being mindful of the feelings of the breath, just be with the feelings of the breath. When other things impinge, when other things arise, know it and let it go. That instruction leads to jhana. The issue is how much can you do it? How much can you really be with your breath? How quickly can you see your thoughts? How strong is your mindfulness that you can let them go? That has nothing to do with a method. That has nothing to do with a concept. Other things that I've been saying, one has to practice the meditation consistently and diligently because mindfulness gets stronger with consistency. So if it's the case that we do one retreat and we go back to a really busy life, we hardly meditate at all, we come back and we do another retreat, it's probably not likely that one would get jhana. If one does follow the Ajahn's instruction, diligent with one session a day, build up to two sessions a day, build up to three sessions a day, do a few retreats a year, then you're going to be increasing your chances. But one of the things in my own experience that leads to more samadhi is contentment with the peacefulness that arises. So contentment actually plays an important role. So you, 
and tend to be aware of the breath. Keep giving the interest, keep giving the attention, at, attention. some calmness, some peacefulness arises and one is fully with that, is fully present with that experience without craving for more. But one notices the thing that led to that feeling, those peaceful feelings, is the consistency of the mindfulness with the object. So it's the vitaka and the vichara. It's the being aware of the object and placing the mindfulness on the object. And so one keeps up when the mind begins. And I think a lot of, a habit a lot of people have is when the mind gets a little bit peaceful, they, they kind of delight too much in the peace and they let go of their awareness of the object. Another challenge is when you try to squeeze the object and that also obstructs further peacefulness. So it's a real trick. It's a real trick of a, and a, and a, only a lot of practice is a thing. This is why I don't think it's a theory. I don't think it's a trick. I don't think it's a method. It's the, it's the ability to place the awareness on the object and there's a kind of a being aware of it and relaxing. If you relax too much, you'll come out of the peacefulness. The mind will start wandering. If you place too much intention on knowing the object in every detail, the mind won't become peaceful. And it's a, it's a particular, it's like a graceful dance. You are aware of the object. When the peacefulness arises, you enjoy, you relax into the peacefulness without letting go of your awareness of the object. Sometimes a sense of space grows in the mind, maybe really vast space, but the mind has its center. It's aware of the object. That does lead to the first jhana, in my experience. I can't speak of the other ones. And uh, metta practice, similarly, one just keeps, one can cultivate metta jhana. You start with the thoughts, so your vitaka and your vichara, I'm just going to say that the piti is the rapture. As I was saying earlier this morning, rapture is like the waves on top. You want to go deeper. Sukha is the, the cool, calm, steady, vast peace. So you don't, don't, if you get excited about rapture, you'll be raptures for a while and then you'll come out. If you're mindful of the rapture and you're mindful of your meditation object, the rapture deepens and leads you into and what they call Thai Samop Yin, tranquility. And you still, so there's a lot of people that think, oh, I've got my reward, I'm going to rest now. And it's like, no. As the, as the samadhi gets more subtle, as the breath gets more subtle, the mindfulness has to get more subtle and sharper. And this is the trick. And, and so this is a, what, something that's learned through experience. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of hours of practice is what produces the ability to know how to be with the object in the right way, with the vitaka and the vichara, the awareness of the object, the interest in the object, the rapture, the tranquility. One knows how to be with the object, absorb into the object, relax into the awareness, deepen the tranquility, stay very still. That comes with practice. And uh, similarly with the metta, one has the intention to have loving kindness, can use the breath. It starts with thoughts, it starts with oneself, being so it is easy to have loving kindness towards. We train in stages to include more and more beings, at which point it becomes much more kind of a selfless. There's not much of a sense of an ego or a being who, who has metta. The metta just kind of takes over. The metta, pure unconditional love, becomes the object. And, you don't, and the person doesn't have to say, may I be well, may all beings be well, may I be happy, may all beings be happy. Just as the awareness of the breath and the buddha can lead the mind to a peaceful state, and that peace becomes the object, Buddha falls away, awareness of the breath falls away, the peacefulness is there for some time, come out of the peacefulness, pick up the breath again. With metta, the thoughts, the intention, the radiating, the metta, making it more and more impartial, metta just become pure, vast, steady, metta becomes the object. And similarly, then thoughts will come back, and then you can go back to the object, may I be well, may I be happy. So, it's tricky. And uh, as I said, we should, I really like that Ajahn Anand 
describes Kanika Samadhi as Samadhi, Upajara Samadhi as Samadhi, and Apana Samadhi as Samadhi. He doesn't separate those beginning stages of concentration from jhana. And I think that's wise because it's the contentment with it and being able to be still when the mind becomes peaceful that goes to the next level. And not recognizing the value of that, being discontent, trying to get something else, I don't believe that it will lead to it. So, in my own experience, it's one of the reasons I like to go to India and take eight to 10 hours a day of meditating is even as a monk, who's been, who meditates five hours a day for 27 years, my samadhi gets better, more firm and more stable if I'm doing eight to 10 hours a day for more than eight days. That's the kind of effort that's required. And uh, some people appear to develop samadhi more quickly, as I've said many times during this retreat. Those are the people who put in vast efforts in their past lives. And uh, there's only one way to grow in this path of dana, sila, and bhavana, and that's by doing it. So if somebody appears to progress quickly, they've put in the hours before. Sometimes people who make enormous auspicious merits, possibly sometimes their, their development of samadhi may be faster. If, uh, if someone, due to their good fortune, has made offerings to many arahants, many buddhas, and uh, has very, very potent, auspicious merit, particularly supporting others to practice so that others develop peaceful minds, then when you come to, come to practice, your mind might become more peaceful more quickly if you've, if you've made that kind of auspicious merit. One of the requests of Wisaka, when she asked for the special privilege of being able to offer alms, bathing cloths to every monk and alms food to traveling monks, and alms food to Sikh monks. And the Buddha said, well, what's your intention, Visaka? Visaka was already a stream enterer, of course. And Visaka said, when I think of this, my mind will be glad. When my mind is glad, it will concentrate easily. And Lord Buddha said, it's true. So there's uh, making merit, making the, recollecting the merit, feeling glad, then uh, the mind can, because this pity, this sukha, this rapture, there's different ways, different types of reflective meditations can give rise to rapture. And then that rapture can lead the mind to tranquility. So, Wisaka was skilled, not surprisingly. So, we keep practicing and it happens in its own time when we lay the conditions. And uh, I wish you every success. And I believe I have been giving you the instructions that lead to jhana whether or not it did <laughs> depended on how much you practice and how sincerely you practiced. So. Okay, I hope that something I said was interesting, useful or entertaining.